Let's look at what we're going to look at because as I said before, we can't look at it all. An overview of psychology. Psych equals soul. Ology, the study thereof. Soul, study of soul. Now, as I said before, I can posit a soul, but that's a metaphysical construct. Meta being above, physical being this plane of reality we share. I cannot demonstrate empirically that there is such a thing, but isn't it interesting that our discipline is named after the soul? Something that can't be demonstrated, and yet we endeavor to be highly scientific and empirical, which means highly scientific, and base our conclusions on data, and not just waxing poetic or philosophical, but to understand through science, a process that we're going to go over here shortly, the understanding of the human experience which for most people includes some idea that there's an essence inside of you that might exist after this body shuts down and shuffles off to atom land to become other things again and again and again. Matter's not destroyed, is it? Y'all know about that, right? Just changes forms. But what about the thing that animates the matter? That's a different matter altogether. Ha! I made a pun. <laughs> that little symbol right there is Greek. It's all Greek to me. Psi equals psychology. I was in my senior year at UNC Charlotte before I realized that that's what that meant. It's a good piece of shorthand. I just saw it in the department and thought, man, they love that little symbol. That little symbol means psychology. So if you're writing notes, one way to make your note writing easier is to develop a shorthand for yourself. Now I didn't have to write industrial organizational psychology. I could just write I O Psi. Three symbols got it for me, and I knew what it meant. So that's what we're after. When you see that symbol, it's not UT, although some of y'all love UT, right? You could just say the UT symbol is really psychology, right? The psychology of the UT symbol. What is psychology? Psychology is the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. You can study things unscientifically. I can read other people's accounts of it without ever having making sure that and having made sure that they actually did empirical research. That's what philosophy amounts to. They're studious people. I have a bachelor's in philosophy and a bachelor's in psychology. Philosophy is important to me. Philosophy drives science. Everybody with a PhD after their name is by definition a philosopher because that means doctor of philosophy in chemistry or doctor of philosophy in physics or doctor of philosophy in psychology. PhD is a ph philosophy degree and a research degree. So philosophically speaking, that provides us with the questions, but scientifically speaking, that's what provides us with the answers. So here you have a term in white font. What does that mean? Could be on your test. Now, distinguish from what? Up there, psych equals soul, not on your test. Logos equals study of a subject, not on your test. Psi symbol equals psychology, not on your test. Guarantee, not on your test. This may or may not be on it, but it's likely to be on it. Most of them ain't going to be that easy. By golly, you should be able to see a multiple choice question that says psychology is the study of, and if it says uh, monkeys, giraffes, and bananas, that ain't it. If you see something that says study of behavior and mental processes, you should go, that's the one. So there'll be a couple of questions that are easy because that's foundational. We're the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. And as it turns out, you can't get a study of mental processes without behavior. You got a mental process telling you what that means to you right now. I won't know what you think mentally until you engage in the behavior of writing it out for me or the behavior of speaking it to me. Right? So behavior is locked into almost anything we do. Even when we take an MRI, right? We're asking you to behave in a way to get you locked into a thing and then somebody's got to be pushing the buttons. Behavior is inherent in understanding mental processes. We're questing for answers to ancient questions. We started out as philosophy. And then this thing arose called natural science. They wanted to understand the book of creation. They really did. Y'all know Darwin was a Christian, right? That he studied theology. That he set out on the HMS Beagle not to discover evolution, but to discover evidence for the captain of the HMS Beagle, Fitzgerald, evidence of Noah's flood. 
and that what he found was painful to him. It took him years to actually publish it. But what he was on to was a bunch of data that just didn't fit for him. He had to come up with new ways to explain it and to understand it. Because if you're looking at the data objectively, then it tells you something. It doesn't necessarily suggest an answer. In fact, they fought back and forth and still fight back and forth on what all the data that we can accumulate actually means. It's impossible to say for a fact it's this or it's that, but we can make an assumption based on a theory and then test the theory. And that's what natural science was doing, but it had not been applied to the realm of philosophy, which are where the big questions are. Why do I exist? How can I learn anything at all? If I learn it, how could I possibly remember it? Why do I gauge in certain kind of relationships that are fulfilling and other ones that are detrimental to my life? Why do I do these things? How do these things occur? Those are big questions. But you can wax poetic all day long on big questions without really satisfying yourself with an answer until you start looking at data, which doesn't supply you automatically with an answer, but it starts letting you eliminate possibilities. Whittle your way down to what might be truth with a little t, so that you get a better and better and better understanding. Structuralism is in white font, and I want you to just see this because we don't have time to go over it. We'll hit it here shortly. You see that this material over here that is indented under the white font, yes? That's what you'd want to know for your test. This over here, which is an interesting sidebar piece of information that is not indented under the white font, I'll cover because I think it's interesting and important, but I will not hold you responsible for it on your test. If you will show up every day to this class, I will hone you in on what you need to study so that you will do well in this class and not only do well in this class, but hopefully accumulate knowledge that will change your life in some small way to some giant way and the lives of others. So when we look at things like structuralism, I can't ask you a question about every field of psychology within 25 questions, but I could ask you to know the difference between structuralism and functionalism, right, and behaviorism on one question, right? So if you know those four, five, or six disciplines well, you can answer to one question. But the things that won't be on your test will be distinguished for you as such so that you will not waste time doing things that will not benefit you in the long run. And that's it for today. I will see you on Wednesday here forward. All it is is psychology that might be on your test. So we were talking about how you know what you should know for your tests. I'm going to hone you in on that. I'm going to talk about more stuff than I'm going to test you on because I think it's important, certainly for context, hopefully for your life. And then I'm going to key you in on the material you need to know for your tests. And I'm going to highlight that with white font. So anytime you see white font, you should be writing something. I encourage you to write your own notes and not just follow along on the ones you printed out from me. You know that my notes, these notes, are on D2L in black and white. You should get them, download them, read them before you come to class, and then bring some blank paper so that when you see the topic come up, you'll be inclined to write what you hear me say, which is to say I'm going to expound upon the foundation you've laid when you read this to begin with. So then you hear my examples, you can ask questions, clarification expounding further on the topic, you write all that down, and now you have a super fantastic guide for what you ought to read in the book. Remember I said you ought to get a book, but I recognize not everybody has time to read a whole book? Structuralism's in your book. It's also in the index of the book. You can go right there and read a paragraph or two on structuralism to strengthen your knowledge about the topic. Now I can't ask you a question about every single thing that I have highlighted with white font, but what you'll see is when we look at structuralism and functionalism and psychodynamics, cognitive perspective, that they're all white font and you should be able to distinguish the difference between those when you solve them on a test. So if I gave you a description of a school of thought in psychology, you go, oh yeah, 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 that's structuralism. Because you know it, because you overstudied it, because I keyed you in on what you needed to know, and therefore you utilized your time efficiently and maximized your learning so that you got stuff you can use for life. Structuralism, probably you ain't going to use in your life, but you're going to use it on your test. 
But if you're philosophically minded, you might use it in your life because structuralism is essentially looking at consciousness. The consciousness that we all experience is something you're in right now. Some people's unconscious if they're asleep or passed out or knocked out. So they don't experience the reality that we're all sharing right now. But there's different levels of consciousness. You can be fully engaged in the very moment we're in right now and totally locked in on what I'm saying or what I'm doing or what you're saying or what you're doing. Or you can be in a state of consciousness that is far removed from the place that you're at. You ever driven somewhere and kind of just realize you don't remember how you got there? You just kind of realize you're there. Or you've been in a movie, right? And people came in and out, cough, popcorn, drop stuff, and you didn't even notice that. Or you were reading a book, somebody in the room and said your name, and you didn't even hear them because you were so into that moment because your consciousness varies from moment to moment depending on the situation. But consciousness is something we all experience as human beings. It's what makes us uniquely human. We seem to be conscious in a way that other species may not be. And so our fundamental goal for these early psychologists, this is our history of psychology here, was to understand this unique human consciousness. And the structuralists wanted to break it down structurally. They felt like most things have structure, right? You look at anything and it's built of smaller things, which are built of smaller things. And so if consciousness exists, it must have units of consciousness. And so they tried to examine the structure of consciousness, hence the name structuralism. So that's what you're looking at. You should be able to hear structuralism or talk about structuralism in a way that you could easily teach it to somebody else. If you could teach the concept to somebody else, you'll get it right on the test. And it's not a tough concept, but you got to differentiate between all these little uh, jargon-based terms we have and the names you might see. I'm not going to hold you responsible for a bunch of names and a bunch of dates. But this one name, right, him, Wilhelm Wundt. I used to think it was Wil Wilhelm Wundt because I was American. And then I was told, no, that's W's or V's in German. That's Wundt. So then I walked around saying, Wilhelm Wundt. And then a student in my class, because I learned from my students as much as they learned from me, who had a German background, said, it's, it's, that's another W there. That's, that's Wilhelm Wundt, right? Not Wilhelm Wundt. So we're pronouncing it in his territory, it'd be Wilhelm Wundt. And Wundt did a big favorite to everybody. You remember we were talking about how philosophy existed and all of our big questions came from philosophy and how natural science emerged out of philosophy using the scientific method to do empirical work to better understand our world and our universe. Well, Voot started doing empirical work to better understand a human experience. And in that sense, he took psychology out of the explicit realm of philosophy and made it into a science. And that date you see right there, 1870. Is a symbolic date. He opened the first laboratory that explicitly was under the study of psychology at the University of Leipzig and said that psychology should be modeled after the hard sciences. In other words, we should seek to collect data. Objective, empirical observation should guide our theorizing, right? And that is a remarkable move because before that, all the stuff that we talked about in psychology was in the domain of philosophy. It took a while to separate it. Well, one of the ways you separate that is you do the research. To do the research, you need lab space, and lab space is at a premium at every university. There's never enough space. So to establish your own laboratory was a big deal. And in a sense, that's our symbolic marking of the birth of psychology as an independent science. You see that little asterisk right there? The asterisk right there tells you something that you won't find in your black and white copies of the notes, but I appreciate you all making the effort to be here today. I appreciate your commitment. I appreciate your time. That little asterisk means it might be a bonus question on your test. So knowing the Wilhelm Wundt as a name and the 1879 as a date, I won't hold you responsible for that on the test in a, in a pure test question is four points, but you might see it in a bonus question worth an additional two points. If you get it wrong, no, no points off on a bonus question. If you get it right, it adds two points to your test. There's two of those on every test, so you can score a maximum of 104. Just getting all the questions right. I told you I write good tests. People make 104s on all of my tests. Multiple people get 100%. Not tons and tons, but reliably 10, 15 people. Those people are very diligent students. They study very hard, and the questions are such that they get them right.
here for your success, but you're going to have to do the studying, and this is a guide to help you do so. So Wilhelm Wundt was a founder of structuralism, and we'll talk a little bit more about him because he's an important figure. He's an old white dude with a beard. And it turns out that because of uh, all kinds of prejudices, bigotry against non-whites and females, that that's what you see as the founding fathers of a lot of sciences are a bunch of European white males, many of which sport beards. Because they didn't let other people into the academic game. It was not a fair level playing field. Diversity was not only not appreciated, it wasn't tolerated. So, wrong-minded as it was, we later see that psychology now embraces diversity because the data show that, used appropriately, diverse elements of society coming together create synergy and better products and better bottom lines for companies. And we can see that everybody can succeed in our science if given a fair chance. And what you see now is a lot of diversity in psychology. But when we started out, historically, it's a bunch of old white dudes, right? who have some very racist and very sexist views on the world that they thought were just the way it was because that is the way the world had been. But psychology actually was the first to start testing those assumptions and finding out that that common sense was all wrong. That people had all kinds of abilities not ascribed to them, not allowed to them, and therefore they didn't exhibit, which was then taken as confirmation that they didn't have it at all. But some pioneers in psychology, not Wilhelm, uh, got us on the track to understanding human psychology much better. Introspection is a technique. Technique of looking inside subjects. Well, how am I going to know, if I want to understand your consciousness, what your experience is? Back in those days, there was certainly no such thing as an MRI or a CAT scan. And that only gives us limited data in terms of what's physically occurring in the brain as certain thoughts happen, if you're doing a functional MRI, for example, or what kinds of lesions might exist if you've had some kind of insult to the brain tissue. Right? But back then, if I wanted to know whether you saw a light at a certain level of illumination, or if you heard a sound at a certain decibel level, or when it became painful to experience those perceptions, I would have to ask you. And introspection was a formalized process whereby you trained participants what they called subjects back then, to give you information in a systematic way so that you could collect data relatively objectively, keeping in mind that these are subjective impressions of how perception and other things occur. Given that the subjects were trained, they would be able to give you back information that you could accumulate and then look across people, right? And, and form groups and understand how different functions occurred with different people at different times, depending on what you're studying. So the introspection method got a lot of slamming from other disciplines who said that's really too loose. And the other discipline in particular was behaviorism, which we'll cover in a minute. They said that's, that's just asking people what's going on and how do they know what's going on? You've ever had the experience of like seeing a stick and you put it in the water and it looks like it's bent? The stick didn't get bent. Your eyes are deceiving you because of the refraction, right? So if your own sensations can be a little tricky, how much more could it be tricked inside your own perception where you're making sense of what you think you experience? But that's all you had access to. And interestingly enough, that's what we still do today. 